Good day, grade 11 learners. My name is Ndombi Lada. This lesson is brought to you by Saibono Discovery Center in collaboration with Gauteng Department of Education. Let's quickly look into it. Okay, grade 11, as I've introduced myself, I am Ndombi Lada. Today's chapter is Animal Nutrition, and the focus will be on dentition, organs as well as the functions of those organs that we'll be talking about. Now we all know that animals need food, but basically they do not need food in an actual fact, they need the nutrients that they get from the food they eat so that they'll be able to perform their daily activities. However, animal digestive system is designed in such a way that it is able to break down to absorb as well as to assimilate all these nutrients that they are getting from the food they eat. Now these nutrients are used uh, by the body to provide energy. That is the first function or the first reason why nutrients are important. And then they are also used to repair all the damaged tissues and they are also able to do what? To regulate the bodily uh, processes. Now all mammals or all the mammalian animals have the teeth that are adapted to eat certain types of food. And we all know that there are only four different types of, of, uh, of teeth. However, not all the mammals have all the set or the full uh, types of, what, of teeth. Now, when we look into this uh, picture, we can see that this picture shows us a, a balanced diet. We all know that when we talk of a balanced diet, we are simply talking about a diet that has the, all the correct proportions of what of the nutrients and we know that each nutrient is responsible uh, for to perform a certain function in a certain part of the body so this picture shows us different um, food which are having different nutrients and those nutrients will perform certain functions in different parts of the bodies now let's get into the business of the day now, um, I have spoken about teeth. We all know that there are four different types of teeth. Namely, the first one um, are the incisors. Now, when we look into this diagram or when we look into this uh, picture, we can see the incisors. These are the incisors. Excuse me. These are the incisors. And then the incisors are usually found uh, in front of uh, our mouth. And then the second type of uh, the teeth that we can have are the canines. So the blue teeth are the canines. And then the other types of the teeth, we've got the premolars, the orange ones, the premolars. And then the last type of the teeth, we are having the molars. All these green uh, teeth are the uh, molars. Now let us look into the structure as well as the function of each teeth. Now we've spoken about the incisors. We've seen that these are the incisors. Now the incisors are chisel shaped. So this is an example or this is an incisor. So when you look into the shape, you can see that it has the chisel shape. And then what are the functions of the incisors? The uh, functions of the incisors is to do what is to cut and to bite food. So those are the functions of the incisors. The second type are the canines. We've seen where the canines are. And then the canines, uh, they are a little bit pointed as compared to the what to the incisors. So when we look into the shape of the canines, they are a little bit pointed. And then what is the function or what are the functions of the canines? They are used to catch, to hold, to tear or to kill a prey. And then the other uh, uh, type of a teeth, we are having them premolars. Now when we look into the premolars from the diagram, these are the premolars, the orange ones, and then when we look into this uh, small diagram, the picture, this is the premolar. Now when we look into the shape, they are flat, however uneven. They are not pointed, they are flat, but uneven. And then what is the function or what are the functions of the premolars? We are using premolars to grind or they are used to grind and to crush the food. Now the last type are the molars and then the molars are this uh, green uh, set and then when you look into the molars here they are also flat 
and uneven. They are almost the same as the, mo uh, as the premolars. So what are the functions now of what of the premolars? The premolars are also used to grind and to crush the food. Now, lastly, this is not a type of a teeth but we are having uh, the teeth which are referred to as the canasial teeth now what what are we talking about when we talk of the canasial um, teeth we are simply talking about the specialized premolars and molars they are said to be specialized because it is depending on the shape that they've got. They do not have the shape of the molars and the premolars that we are used to. They are not having the flat and uneven shape. However, they are a, a little bit jacked and they have that triangular shape. So in other words, these are the molars and the premolars which are jacked and are triangularly shaped. So in other words, they do not give us the fifth type. However, they are the molars and the premolars which are triangularly shaped. And these molars and premolars or these specialized molars and premolars are mostly found on the what? On the carnivores or on the carnivores animals. So these are said to be what? To be them canasial teeth and then they are used to do what to cut the meat now um let us look into our uh, different organisms and on the types of food they are feeding on the first type will be having herbivores what are herbivores this is just a refresher a uh, course or a reminder grade 11s we all know that uh, these types of organisms, we did them in our grade 10 syllabus. However, let's quickly refresh our memories that when we talk of the caniv uh, I mean the herbivores, we are simply talking about the plant eaters. In other words, these are the organ uh, organisms or animals that are feeding on plant materials. Secondly, okay, before I go to the second organism, the example there will be the cow, the deer, the horse, the giraffes, the squirrel, and the butterflies. So all these are the examples of what of herbivores. Second organisms are them carnivores. Now, when we talk of the carnivores, we are simply talking about the meat eaters animals in other words these are the animals that are feeding on what on meat in other words they hunt and kill what they prey so that they can get food and then the examples will be the lion we all know that a lion um hunts and kill its prey we'll be talking of the tiger the jackal the vulture the owl the eagle the snake as well as the spider so all these organisms are the examples of what of the carnivores and then the last uh, example, it will be the omnivore. So omnivores are the plant and animal eaters. In other words, they feed on both plants and animals. So these are the organisms that are feeding on plant material as well as animals. And then the examples will be the bear, the raccoon, the crow, and human beings. So we are also falling under what? Under um, a heavy, I mean omnivores. You can bear witnesses that we eat plants and we also eat animals. So we are the good examples of what? Of the omnivores. Now, let us look into the dentition of each organism now. Let's qu uh, first look uh, at the herbivores. What type of teeth, the dentition that is found in the omnivores? Now, when we look into the um, uh, omnivores, we can see that they are using what they've got, them incisors. And then they are using their incisors, they are using their incisors to do what? To cut the plant materials. However, these omnivores lack canines. As you can see, there's a gap here. There's a big gap. There's a big gap, meaning that this is where the canines were supposed to be embedded on. However, omnivores lack what? They lack the um, canines. And then when we look into this uh, organism or to this structure again, there is a big gap without teeth or without a set of teeth, meaning that in this space, that's where the canines were, support, uh, were supposed to be embedded on. So we can safely say that they lack what? They lack, uh, they lack canines. And then they are using their molars and premolars to do what? To grind food, to grind all the plant materials they are feeding on. And then remember, these are the examples. We've got the horses uh, as what as the examples of the herbivores. 
looking into the second example, we are having now, um, let me change the color, we are having them carnivores. We said carnivores are the animals or the, uh, yes, the meat eaters. So when we look into the dentition of the carnivores, we can see that they are using their incisors to do what? To shred or to slice the, the meat. So they are using the incisors, they are using the incisors to shred or to cut the meat. And when we look again into the second type of the teeth, we are seeing that they've got a well-developed canine. So they've got a well-developed uh, canines. They've got a well-developed canines. These are the well-developed canines. You can safely see them, a well-developed canines. So they are using these canines to do what? They are using these canines to do what? To, um, to, to, to tear to catch and to hold what the meat so they've got a very strong and well-developed canines these are our carnivores and then lastly they are having the molars as well as the premolars which are modified to form the carnassial teeth remember i said the carnassial teeth are the specialized or, uh, are the specialized molars and premolars which are having the rectangular shape when you look into these molars and premolars when you look into these molars and premolars they are having the triangular shape so we are they are not as um other premolars as well as molars of other organisms but they are specialized in, in such a way that they are forming that uh, triangular shape so these are forming what we call kinesial teeth and then these kinesial teeth remember we said they are used to cut the meat so only carnivores are having what the kinesial teeth and then lastly, the last organism that we have is uh, the omnivores. Remember, I have made an example that even human beings are the good examples of what of them, omnivores. These are the organisms that are feeding on both plants as well as meat, uh, 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 meat uh, 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 food. So the type of uh, dentition looks like this. It looks exactly like a, what a human beings one. In other words, uh, omnivores have all different types of what of teeth they are having their uh, premolars they are having the molars the premolars the incisors as well as the canines so human beings are having all this set so that they will be able to do what they will be able to eat both plants as well as animal material now we're moving forward let us look into the digestive system or the human digestive system the human digestive system is made up of the alimentary canal and then this alimentary canal is associated with different organs we are going to look into each organ as the lesson proceeds now the animal um, canal is made up of the mouth so this is the mouth we all know where the mouth is is made up of the mouth it is made up of the larynx which is situated to uh, uh, at the back of the mouth it is made up of the oesophagus or the oesophagus and then it is made up of the stomach this is the stomach it is made up of the small intestines these are the small intestines and then it is also made up of the large intestines it is also made up of what of the accessory glands now when we talk of the accessory glands we are having the liver and then on the liver we are there's a, a gallbladder which which is attached on the liver and the function of the gallbladder is to store bile we'll talk about this uh, later on and then secondly there is a pancreas which is also a, 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 an accessory organ we've got a, a pancreas and then the last one we are having the salivary glands so there are salivary glands which are found inside the mouth so we are going to tackle each and every organ one by one uh, to see how it functions in our digestive system now let's start first with the mouth now um the first part that we see when our mouths are closed are the two lips the upper lip and the lower lip so the mouth is made up of two lips which are uh, situated in front 
And then when we open up our mouth or when we open a mouth, this is what we are going to see. Inside a mouth, there's a tongue which is embedded on the floor of the mouth. There's also teeth. There are also teeth which are situated on the lower jaw. And then when you look into the upper part, you'll see that there is a hard palate. So the palate is where your tongue touches when you talk. So that part is called a palate. So there's a hard part, there's a hard part, and there's also a soft part towards the end of the what? Of the mouth. Again, there are teeth which are also embedded on the upper jaw. So this is what we see when we open up our mouth. And then towards the end of the mouth, there's a small cartilage which is called an epiglottis. An epiglottis. So other textbooks are using uh, the uvula, but this is also uh, termed as epiglottis. So this is basically what we see when we open our mouth. Now let us take the first part now uh, of the mouth, which is the tongue. So we've seen that the tongue is embedded on the floor of the mouth. Now what does the tongue do in the digestive system? Number one, we need to know exactly how does the tongue look like. So the tongue is muscular and movable organ. In other words, it is not stagnant. It is moving. As I am talking, you can see that my tongue is moving and it is also muscular. So it is that organ that pushes food between the teeth. If the t uh, food gets between the teeth, it is the tongue that is going to push that food between the teeth. And it is also assisting during mastication. Now, when we talk of mastication, we are simply uh, talking about what? Chewing. Mastication is chewing. So we are using the scientific terminology for chewing, which is mastication. So to masticate is to grind or is to crush or is to chew food. So in other words, the very same tongue assists during uh, mastication. So what uh, does the tongue do again? It is also assisting um, by mixing the food with what? With saliva. And why is it that happening? So that the food that we eat can form a bolus shape or can form a bolus form. So it is because of a tongue to take all this scattered food that we were chewing inside here to form it into a shape which is like a ball, which is now termed a bolus. Why is food need, uh, needed to be formed into a bolus? So that it can be able to do what? To be swallowed easily. Otherwise, you cannot swallow food being scattered as it is. So it needs to be formed into a bolus shape or into a bolus form. So what forms that, bol that bolus form? It is our tongue so that it assists or it makes um, swallowing possible. And then lastly, um, tongue is referred to as a taste organ. We all know that it is a taste organ, so it tastes your salt, it tastes your sweet, it also tastes the sourness. So all the taste parts are found in the what? In them tongue we all know especially girls when we cook before you you can <coughs> serve the food or the dish you always use your tongue to test for salt you use your tongue to test for sour if there's something that is sour which has been cooked you also use your tongue to test the sweetness of the food so we can uh, attest to that uh, the tongue is also what a, a, a sense organ of what of taste now the second part will be the salivary glands. Now there are three pairs of salivary glands which are found inside the mouth. The salivary glands are only found inside the mouth, not anywhere else. Now the salivary glands are referred to as 
exocrine glands. Now, why are they referred to exocrine glands, not endocrine glands? They are exocrine glands because they pour their secretions into the ducts. And then what are the secretions in uh, this instance? It is the saliva. The secretions here will be what? The saliva. So the saliva will be, will be poured into what? Into the ducts, not directly into blood. That's why the salivary glands are referred to as what? As exocrine glands. Now, I've said that there are three pairs of salivary glands which are situated in the mouth or in the muscles around the mouth. The first one is the parotic salivary gland. So this is the si uh, parotic salivary gland. The second uh, type of the salivary gland that we have is the sublingual. So the sublingual explains itself. In other words, is the salivary gland that is uh, situated or is that is found um, underneath the tongue. Re remember when you talk of lingual, we are also referring to the tongue. So this is the uh, salivary gland that is situated in the tongue. And then the last pair will be the submandibular gland. And then the submandibular gland, they are also situated towards the end of the what? Of the mouth and then where there is, ma where there are muscles. In other words, the salivary glands are only found or where the, there are muscles in the mouth. So these are three different types of or three different pairs of what? Of uh, salivary glands. Now what is the function of salivary gland? The main function of salivary gland is to secrete is to secrete saliva is to secrete saliva and why is saliva important saliva is important so that it can moisten the food that we eat it can also lubricate food so that we do not swallow dry food so in other words saliva is very very important to soften and to lubricate the food that we eat at the same time the very same uh, this uh, 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 salivary gland they also secrete the enzymes which are called salivary amylase or the carbohydrates so these are the enzymes which are secreted by the salivary glands and what do they do they hydrolyze or they break down the carbohydrates during chemical in, uh, 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 digestion in other words these um <coughs> excuse me these <coughs> these um Enzymes, they break down the what? The carbohydrates that we are eating. So they are breaking them down during chemical uh, reaction. So the, na the name of these enzymes are called the salivary amylase or the carbohydrates, not the carbohydrates. The carbohydrates. In other words, this is the enzyme that is going to break down the carbohydrates. Carbohydrates breaks down carbohydrates. Uh, carbohydrates during what? During chemical digestion. Moving forward, now we are still um, talking about the mouth and all the parts which are found inside the mouth. Now we are looking into the teeth. We have touched the teeth when we started with our lesson. Now we, uh, the human teeth, human teeth, I mean the human has di four different types of what of teeth we have spoken about them earlier on the first one we are having the incisors and then the incisors are um chiseled shapes of they've got the shape of a chisel and then the function they are used to bite food into smaller pieces and then how many uh, incisors does a human being have they have eight incisors all in all and then the second one is the canine and then the canine they are conical in shape we said they are pointed you can see that it is a little bit point uh, pointed and then what do they do what are they used for during digestion they assist in doing what in tearing off of food and then how many canines does a human being have we only have four canines and then the second type, I mean the third type is the premolar or are the premolars. And then remember we said the premolars are flat, however they are uneven. For them being uneven, now they form how many uh, cups? They form two cups. 
cast. In other words, if this is a premolar, it is not even, it is uneven, so it forms one, the first uh, caps, and then the second caps. So it forms two caps, and then what are they used for? They are used to grind food. And how many premolars do we have? We only have eight premolars. And then the last type of a foot is the, I mean of a teeth, is the molar or are the molars. And then the molars are also large flat surface with three to five casts. It is uh, different from the premolars. So if it has three to five, it can have one, two, maybe, and three or five. So it has about more than three uh, cups, three to five cups. And then they are also used to grind and to, gra uh, to crash food. And how many molars all in all does a human being have? We have 12 molars. Now let us look into uh, the dentition of um, a human. So human, uh, the, the, the dental formula of a human is uh, said to be two is to one is to two is to three. So how does this formula come up? We are having two incisors on the upper half. So we are having two incisors and then we are having one canine and then there will be two premolars and one, two, three, what molars. So these are the teeth on the upper jaw but the half of the upper jaw. In other words, the other half will be having the very same set. So when we add two, one, two, and three, we get eight. So in other words, this is half upper jaw. It gives us eight teeth. And then on the other half upper jaw, we are going to get the very same two is to one is to two is to three, meaning that we still have two uh, incisors, one canine, two premolars, and three molars. And then how many are they? They are eight. So this is eight on the up half and eight on the up half. So when you add eight and eight, how many do you get? You get 16, meaning that on the upper jaw, in all, there are 16 what? 16 teeth. Same applies now with what? With the lower jaw. So in the lower jaw, we still have two is to one is to two is to three, meaning that we still have two incisors, one canine, uh, two premolars, and three premolars on the lower half jaw. And then in other words, the other lower half jaw will be, it will be eight this side and eight that side. And then when you add eight and eight, you are going to get 16. So these 16 on the lower jaw and 16 on the upper jaw. How many teeth does a human being have all in all? We are having now 32 teeth. So this is on the normal circumstances. I am not talking about maybe as you grow up, uh, the teeth are getting rotten and all of those things. But this is the under the normal circumstances. I know you'll want to know, ah, what about uh, my friend? He only has 20 teeth or my granny does not have anything at all. But here we are talking under normal circumstances, grade 11. So this gives us now the total number of what? Of teeth and then it goes now to this uh, formula or the dental formula which goes to one is to, I mean two is to one is to two is to three all over two is to one is to two is to three. So I have explained how does this uh, dental formula come about. So all in all we are going to multiply this eight by four. It is going to give us how many? 32. And then now we have completed the mouth and all the parts associated with the mouth. Moving on, uh, moving onwards, we now look into the second part, which is the pharynx. Now, um, when we look into the pharynx, when I mean, when we look into this digestive system, we can see that the pharynx it is uh, at the end of the mouth, uh, uh, just before we get into the neck part. Now, um, after food is swallowed. Remember we said that the, the, the tongue is there to mold the food into the bolus. So after food is swallowed, it will pass down the what? The pharynx. So let me erase this one and change my color so that we can see exactly what is happening. So that food, after it has been formed into bolus, it will be swallowed and passed down the what? The pharynx. And then in the pharynx, there is... Um, 
just behind the pharynx, there is that epiglottis I was talking about. During swallowing, this epiglottis will close here so that the food does not get into the trachea. So this part is the trachea. So the trachea forms part of the, uh, of the respiratory system. So meaning that the food must not get into the, the, the trachea. As a result, during swallowing, the, op the epiglottis closes here and forces food to move down the pharynx and then get into the what? Get into the vesophagus. So at the end of the day, the bolus or that food swallowed will pass down the pharynx and get into the vesophagus. And then from the vesophagus, the vesophagus will assist the move or will force the, the, the food to move down into what now? Into the stomach. And then this movement, the downward movement of food is referred to as peristalsis. In other words, the vesophagus assists with the downward movement of what? Of food from the uh, pharynx down the vesophagus to the stomach. At the end of the day, we are now having our food where now? Into the stomach. Now let us check what is happening now. So the second part or the third part will be the stomach. What is the stomach? A stomach is a big like organ, which is muscular as well. And then it, um, it, it, has, it is made up of three parts. The first part is the fundus. Let me use the different color. The first part is the fundus. And then the second part is the cardiac region or the corpus. The other textbooks are, re are referring to this part as the corpus. And then the last part is the pylorus. So this is the pylorus. And then the pylorus will be having the pyloric region. And then on the fundus, that region is referred to as the fundic region. And then the la the just below the fundic region, that's we've got the corpus part which is referred to as the cardiac region. Now when we look in, uh, into this stomach, inside the inner part of the stomach is made up of these folds. Can you see now? It has so many folds, so many folds. And then these folds are referred to as the, ra, uh, the, ra, the ragay. So inside the stomach, the stomach is not smooth in the inner part of it as we see it from the external uh, uh, appearance. However, inside it is made up of all these folds which are referred to as the ragay. Now again, when we look into this stomach, we can see that there are two uh, spinchers. The first spincher is there just below the vesophagus, and then the second spincher is there towards the end of the what? Of the stomach. Now, the first spincher is referred to as the um, vesophagal spincher. Why vesophagal spincher? Because it is uh, the spincher which is very, very close to what? To vesophagus. Other textbooks are referring to vesophagal spinchers as the, cardi uh, the cardiac spincher. Why the, uh, the, 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 the cardiac spincher? It is because it is named after this region. What is this region? The region is called cardiac region. So the name of this spinter will therefore be cardiac spinter. So these spinters are working as valves. You know, most the valve uh, closes up or opens up. So the spinters are working uh, as valves. And then this one, um, the one that is towards the, the, the duodenum, towards the end of the stomach, is referred to as the pyloric spinter because it is named after this region, and the region is called the pyloric um, spinter. Okay, before I go uh, to the next slide, I want to explain now that after the food has passed from vesophagus, the food will be forced now into what? The food will be forced into the stomach. So the function of the cardiac uh, spinter or of the vesophagal spinter is to prevent this food that is inside the stomach from going backward to the what? To the uh, vesophagus. Remember, we are enforcing the peristaltic movement, the downward movement of what? Of food. In other words, food must not go back. So that's why after all the food has uh, reached the stomach, then what is going to happen? Then 
uh, the, ca the cardiac sphincter will then close up so that it prevents food from going back to the what to the esophagus. And then um, when the food enters, um, uh, uh, I mean, when the food enters the duodenum, leaving the, the, the stomach, the pylorbic splinter uh, will also close up again. In other words, the food now is where is in the duodenum. What is duodenum? The duodenum is the first part of the small intestine. So the food will move now or will leave the stomach and then get into the small intestine. And then this pylorbic, uh, pyloric splinter will also close up, preventing the food from the small intestine not getting back into the what into the stomach we want the downward movement we are enforcing what the peristaltic movement and then um what is happening now uh, it is that this stomach uh, the stomach secrets it secretes the stomach secretes the gastric juices the stomach secretes uh, the gastric uh, the gastric juices and then this gastric juice has the enzyme it also has the hydrochloric acid so the main function of the stomach is to secrete or to produce but the correct weight is to secrete the gastric juices and then these gastric juices are having the what the enzymes as well as uh, as well as the hydrochloric acid so these uh, enzymes and hydrochloric acid will be mixed with what now with the food remember that food the bolus food is the mixture of what of um food as well as what food as well as saliva so we are having food which has saliva this food will be mixed now with what with gastric juice the gastric juice has the hydrochloric acid as well as an enzyme now to form what we call to form what we referred to as a chime so what is a chime chime is a mixture of food which has saliva gastric and gastric juice so that food is now called what chime so inside the stomach we are now talking of chime from the mouth after the bolus form up to the uh, up to the esophagus up until the mixture of the gastric juice as well as um, the food will be now talking of what of them chime now uh, the other part of the alimentary canal is the small intestine now the small intestines um about six meters long so one may ask him or herself so if they are that long ma'am how are, 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 are they accommodated in our digestive system now when we look into the arrangement of uh, this small intestine can you see now they are not uh, arranged in a straight line but they are folded, they are folded, can you see they are folded so that they can be accommodated inside the uh, digestive system. Now the small intestine is divided into three parts. The first part which is the purple one is called the duodenum. The second part of the small intestine is the jejunum, the greenish one in color. And then the, uh, the duodenum has the middle size. And then the last part of the small intestine is the pinkish one. Can you see? And then that is referred to as the ileum. So the ileum is the longest part of the small intestine. Now what is happening? Um, the duodenum receives bile from uh, the, 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 the liver. This is our duodenum. The duodenum will receive bile from the liver. Earlier on, I have mentioned that on the liver, if this is the liver, there is a gallbladder that is attached on the liver. So the function of this gallbladder is to do what? Is to store bile. So this bile from the gallbladder and remember the gallbladder is attached or is situated on the liver. This gallbladder from the liver will therefore get into the duodenum of the small intestine. That's why we are saying that the, ju the duodenum of the small intestine receives gallbladder from the liver. 
not specifically from the liver, but from the part which is attached on the liver. What is that part? The gallbladder. It also receives the enzymes. So these, uh, these uh, I mean these bile salts as well as the enzymes, they are therefore able to digest all the lipids. So the gallbladder as well as the enzymes, they will be able to do what? To digest all the lipids which are in the small intestine, which are in the what? In the duodenum. And then the duodenum is the mid size or is the middle size tube that leads to the longest part, which is the what? Which is the ileum of the, uh, uh, of the small intestine. So the small intestine is lined with four layers. You will see it is lined with uh, four layers. In other words, there's a layer, there's a layer, there's a layer, and there's a layer. So let's quickly to, uh, look into the lining of the small intestine. I've already spoken about this part that uh, the duodenum, the duodenum of the small intestine receives the, uh, the bile salts from the liver as well as the enzymes. Why? So that they will be able to digest the lipids which are in the small intestine. Now let us look into the lining or the, la the layers which are surrounding the small intestine. The outer, the first layer is our outer layer which is called the serosum layer. So the serosa layer is the outermost layer of the small intestine. And then followed by this, uh, the muscular layer. So the muscular consists of longitudinal uh, as well as secular muscles. So this part and this part, these are the longitudinal and, and then these are the secular muscles. They form the second layer which is uh, referred to as the muscular layer. And then the third layer is the, here it is, the submucosa layer. So this is our submucosa, let me use a different color. So this is the submucosa layer. So the submucosa layer is um, made up of uh, the connective tissues. It is also made up of the blood vessels, the lymph, as well as the nerves. So in other words, in the submucosa leaves, uh, layer, that's where we are having the connective tissue, the uh, the lymph uh, as well as the vessels and the nerves they are situated here and then the innermost layer of the small intestine is called the mucosa let me clean my diagram so that you can be able to see the innermost layer is this one which is called the mucosa so this is the mucosa layer and then the mucosa layer contains uh, the columnar epithelial tissues or the columnar epithelial layer and then the columnar epithelial layer secretes mucus so it secretes mucus so if it secretes mucus it means that it, 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 it the, the the inner layer which is the mu, uh, the mucosa it is also made up of uh, millions of projections which are called the villi so these are the projections which are called the villi and then the function of the villi the main function of the villi is for it plays a huge or a major role during absorption now i want us to look into this diagram so this is a diagram that is showing us the part of the alimentary canal specifically we are interested on the small intestine so this is now an enlarged small intestine which is showing us the four layers the outer layer the second layer the um, submucosa as well as the inner layer so there's the inner layer so we said that the inner layer gives rise to finger-like projections which are called the villi so this is now what we see this is how the villi looks like and then this is now the enlarged structure of the villi do you see where does this uh, diagram um, come from so this is an enlarged small intestine which shows all the layers and basically what is happening in the innermost of the small intestine so it gives us the what the villi and then this is the enlarged structure of the villi with what with the columnar uh, epithelial tissues so let's look now into the enlarged structure of the villi 
So this is how the veil, uh, the veil, uh, the veil looks like. Remember, we spoken about the outer layer, which is the serosa, and then the second layer, which is the muscular layer, which has the circular as well as the longitudinal uh, muscles. And then in the submucosal layer, that's where we are having. Um, the connective tissue and the connective tissues with all the limbs, the blood vessels, as well as the veins. So these are the veins, these are the blood vessels which are found in the submucosa. And then in the inner part, that's where we are having the connective tissue. This is the connective tissue and then connective tissue together with the blood capillaries. These are the blood capillaries together with the connective tissue. And then this part is our columnar epidelial. So this is the columnar epidelial. This is the columnar epidelial. And then this is an enlarged structure of the columnar epidelial with its microvilli. So this uh, part is referred to as the intestinal crypt. So this is how the structure of the villi looks like. Now we are moving to uh, the last part of the uh, alimentary canal, which is the large intestine or which are the large intestines. Now when we look into um, this alimentary canal, can you see where the large intestines are situated? So starting from is our esophagus, our stomach, and then here we've got the small intestine. And other than that, this is our large intestine. Now when we look into the large intestine, the large intestine is divided into three parts. The first part is the chiacom. So this is the first part, the chiacom. The chiacom is immediately after the small intestine. And then the chiacom will be followed by the colon. The whole of this, uh, the whole of this uh, large intestine is referred to as what? As the colon. We are having the ascending part of the colon, the transverse colon, and the descending uh, colon. So these are the parts of the colon. And then the last part of the in, uh, large intestine is the rectum. So this is the rectum, and then the rectum will therefore lead into the opening, which is called the anus. Now, when we look into, uh, I've already explained that the chiacom uh, leads from what from the small intestine and then the colon is also referred to as what as the large intestine the other name for the large intestine is the colon uh, the colon or large intestine which is divided into three parts the ascending colon the transverse colon and the descending part of the small intestine and then when we look into the uh, rect uh, the chiacom that's where we can see that I the appendix is attached on the chiacom and then um I've already explained that the large intestine or the colon is uh, divided into ascending, the transverse ascending, in other words, it goes up from the small intestine and then it goes up uh, from the chiacom, it ascends, uh, whatever the undigested food will go up and then they will go through the transverse uh, direction and then lastly they will go into the descending part, descending in other words, all the undigested food will descend. Where are they getting to? They are getting to the uh, rectum where they will be temporarily stored and then eventually they will be ejected through the what? Through the anus. So this is what the diagram is explaining. Now what is uh, mostly found in the large intestine or in the colon um, is uh, the water and mineral salts. Mostly they are absorbed by the what? By the colon. And then other than that, all the unwanted food or all the undigested food will therefore via ascending po uh, position transversely so and then downwards up until they are ejected through the what? Through the anus. So that takes us to the last part of what? Of our um, session or of our presentation. Now it is activity time, grade 11s. The first question or the first activity is our multiple choice and we all know the skills to um, do or to answer the multiple choice question. We 
need to eliminate all the wrong answers at least be left with two possible answers and then out of the two have that one that you think is the most correct one what type of teeth are um, teeth one and two teeth one and two what type of teeth so they are incisors i'm so sorry this already gave you the answer so i will catch you on the next uh, question um the molar teeth are represented by the following numbers in the diagram so which numbers represent the molar teeth are they represented by one to two are they represented by three are they represented by four and five or are they represented by six seven and eight can i get answers okay without any waste of time they are represented by six seven and eight six seven and eight are our uh, molars what are the functions of the teeth numbered three what are the functions of teeth numbered three or what is the function of teeth numbered three so do they cut do they grind do they tm or do they crush food so the answer is they are tearing food they are used to tm food activity two complete the table below or complete the following table so we are given different types of teeth starting from the incisors canines premolars as well as molars so yours is to complete the table by giving the structure of each type what is the structure of the incisor what is the structure of the canine what is the structure of the premolar what is the structure of the molar i'm not sure if you need time because this is what we've been doing great 11 what are the structures or what is the structure of the incisor any school any lena how are incisors structured how are canines structured how are the premolars and the molars structured can i get answers from any of the schools which are with us today uh, i can see that del park is with us let me see the other one elizabeth mateke irene chikochi please anyone who can give us the answer okay without any waste of time great 11 let's okay elizabeth mati am i getting an answer from elizabeth mati these are the mahala marks grade 11s you cannot afford to lose four marks i know you know the answer maybe there are connect uh, connection um, challenges now uh, what you needed to do here you only have to give us the description that the incisors um chisel shaped and then canines are conical or pointed premolars they are flat um with two uh, pointed cusps and then molars are large and flat also un 
evil. So these other ones were not asked. So you were only supposed to give the description or the structure. Activity three, study the uh, scale A and scale B below and answer the questions that follow. So we've got two different scales, scale A and scale B. Now uh, identify A, identify which scale A or B belongs to a herbivore. Which skull A or B belongs to a herbivore? And then which skull A or B belongs to a carnivore? So answers are already there. Skull B belongs to a herbivore and then skull A belongs to a carnivore. Now the follow-up question says provide a reason for your answer. Why did you say B is a herbivore? Why did you say A is a carnivore? So the answers is that A is a carnivore. Why? Because the canines are, they are used canines for biting and holding the, the, the prey. And they've got a very pointed or large or long canines. And then they've got the canasial teeth instead of a flat molars so in other words they've got them pointed or the triangularly uh, triangularly shaped molars and premolars that's why this is a skull of a carnivore b it is a herbivore because they do not have canines so can you see the gap there we have spoken about this Um, does skull B have canisial teeth? Skull B, this is skull B. Does it have canisial teeth? The answer is no. Why does it not have the canisial teeth? Can you see there are no canisial teeth? It is because um, canisial teeth are the specialized uh, molars and premolars that have triangular shape to cut feet. So here we don't see the triangular shaped uh, what uh, molars or premolars. So that's why it is not a, a, a canisial. That's why scalp does not have canisial teeth. Um, activity form. We are given the alimentary canal or the digestive system them with uh, letters from A to G or uh, to H. So write the letter of the part that stores bile. Which letter stores bile? Here. So it is letter number G. Second question on this diagram. Write down the letter of the part where most enzymes are active to digest food. Where most of the enzymes are active to digest food. So most of the enzymes are in the small intestine. And the small intestine is letter D. You must read the question and understand it. So if the question says write the letter, so you must write the letter. If the question says write down the letter, and the name so we'll, we'll write the letter and the name we'll write the letter and the name but here you are only requested to write what then letter and then the last question on this diagram where uh, i mean write the letter of the part where most water and mineral salts are absorbed we've just spoken about that ne? that most water and mineral salts are absorbed where in the large intestine. So where is the large intestine? Large intestine is letter F. And then 4.2, label parts A, C, E, and D. Label A, C, E, and D. What is A? Already, Answers are provided for you. I do not know why. Maybe our technicians 
um, like you so much in such a way that they give you all my answers. All my answers are displayed. I'm going to fight with them. However, these are the types of questions that you can expect to get in your um, a controlled test, your examinations. So A is our usophagus or esophagus. That is one mark. And then uh, C, here is C. C is the pancreas. E, here is E. E is the rectum. And then you were asked to uh, label what again? To label D. So here is D. D is the small intestine. So let us, this takes us to the end of today's uh, session. I hope you enjoyed it and you'll be able to answer all the activities which are based on the dentition, uh, the parts, different parts of um, alimentary canal as well as their functions. So this chapter does not end here. This is the first part of this chapter and then in our next lessons we'll be continuing with our uh, animal nutrition. I hope you have enjoyed it and you'll be able to answer all questions which are based on the animal nutrition, basically the dentition and the functions of those organs that we have spoken about. Until we meet next time, have a great day. Bye-bye.